it's high time for grade 10 students. Here these days we are talking about 14th unit, the continuity of life. And this is the third part of that uh, video set. And here let's see the today's plan. As we know there are some subtopics we must discuss under this continuity of life. And uh, about a few we discussed here. First one the reproduction part it's finished. This is introduction to reproduction. And reproduction of plants. This lesson also completed. Under that uh, vegetative reproduction we discussed last week. But here we are talking about the sexual reproduction. It also comes under the reproduction of plants. And today we will talk about sexual reproduction of plants. Right. Reproduction of plants. This is the recap of from the last lesson. Plant reproduction is of uh, two types. Vegetative reproduction and sexual reproduction. Vegetative reproduction occurs in two ways. Natural vegetative reproduction occurs through these things. Rhizomes, combs, bulbs, stem tubers or such things. And the artificial vegetative reproduction on that also we learn some steps uh, just like uh, different methods uh, planting the, the stem cuttings or layering technique, budding technique and also tissue culture. So today's lesson is the sexual reproduction. Here's the unit of sexual reproduction that is the flower. Let's start our lesson from this point sexual reproduction flower is the reproductive organ of plants and fruits and seeds are produced from flowers this is the first fact in some plants fruit grow without forming seeds that is something you can just remember some fruits fruits produce but without seeds in some plants we can see that also the proce this process is known as parthenogenesis remember the term parthenogenesis means producing fruits without seeds. Sexual reproduction via seeds is the complex process. Actually, this lesson will be a long one. There are a number of contents to discuss here. Sexual reproduction is necessary for the survival of plants. Sexual reproduction also important for the variations or to evolution of the plants. Right. Parts of a flower. Basically, these parts we have learnt in previous grades. Uh, just uh, again recall these things. We can, I will start from this one. This is called pedicel or the peduncle or the stalk. Peduncle part, this part. And uh, it is the part that fix plant the flower to the stem. And this is the receptacle. Uh, and it act as stage of the platform for the flower then these ones are sepals and here these colorful ones are the petals and basically these components uh, provide the protection for the flower and ovary this is the female part of one of female part of the flower and this is style and top stage is the stigma over a style stigma these three consider as the female parts of flower also called pistil and this one filament and this is anther these two are the male parts of, of, of a flower so this flower is a bisexual flower it has female part and the male parts and let's go to this one this is the male's part of the flower and uh, this is anther and there are pollens here the pollens are the male gametes and uh, in andresium or the stamen they form this section is called the andresium and these pollens are haploid that means they are in sense haploid cells then female part this one ovary it contains ovules ovules are the female gametes and it also 
a haploid cell in cell. Then pollens, once the pollens and ovules are unique, then diploid cell will form. And this part is called gyrosium or the pistil part. Stamen and pistil. Stamen, the male part. Pistil is the female part. Next, let's identify, try to identify, this is a real uh, flower as it is separated here. Can you identify the parts here? Let's start from here, these the colorful petals here, these are the petals and these green color ones, they are the sepals and uh, here you can see the ovary and and the stigma should be here and that is the female part and these are the filaments and anthers so that's how we can identify the parts of a flower this is a shoe flower or lebe uh, sorry hibiscus flower and uh, functions of flower parts here there is a flower and separated main parts First, I will pay attention to this one. These are sepals. This is the function of sepals. So it's called the calyx. Calyx is the hall of sepals. What is the function of this calyx? It is the protection of flower bud. And this one, petals or corolla, colorful hall of the flower. There are two functions. One is protection of inner parts of a flower and attraction of insects for the pollination we will learn about pollination hereafter next this one guess it it is the male part and racium or the stem its function is production and releasing of pollen grains male gametes and then this one this is the female part gynaecium with ovary and the stigma style and gynaecium or the pistil its function is production of ova ova are the female gametes right then this is the these are the functions of main parts of a flower right then move on to the sexuality of the flowers why do we talk such topic here sexuality of flowers because we can categorize flowers into different uh, groups according to its sexuality. Let's see how can we categorize the flowers here. Flowers can be categorized as bisexual flowers. That means in bisexual flowers you can see pistil and a stamen both houses in one flower. Both stay in one flower here. That's why we call them bisexual flowers. That means there are unisexual flowers as well. And unisexual, a unisexual flower means it has separated pistillate flowers, female flowers, just with that pistil, pistillate flowers, and the staminate flowers. In the staminate flowers, there is stamen only and the filaments. Therefore, in unisexual flowers, there are two types of flowers as pistillate and staminate flowers. Let's talk about this one in details. Bisexual flowers. Here are the bisexual flowers and examples. This is hibiscus. In that one, we can see this is the female part. This is the male part. And here in this one, this is brinjal, male part sorry female part and male part this is yes guess it this is passion fruit and these are the male parts of the anthers and these are the stamens uh, anthers and this is the pistil or the stigma here this is stigma this is the ovary yes next one this one is the sesbenia flowers in Sri Lanka we call Kathurunga. In them also we can see male and female both parts in one flower. Here these ones are the mustard flowers. You know mustard seeds, the tiny seeds. Then these are the mustard flowers. Also bisexual. 
and this last one guess this flower i think you might have seen this one this is guava also it contains both uh, male and female flowers male and female parts right now let's move on to the unisexual flowers plants again we can divide into monoecious plants and dioecious plants why do we categorize the plants as monoecious and dioecious here because the reason is this in this plant you can see male flower and female flower both houses in one plant that's why we call them monoecious plants both the male female flowers but they are unisexual flowers are found in one plant examples this one corn or maize you can see this is the female flower and these are the male flower both live in one plant this one pumpkin this is the female one you can guess it uh, because the fruits produce in the female flower and this is the male flower male female both flowers found in one plant and this is coconut in coconut these are the female flowers and these are the seed like ones are the male flowers so in them male female both flowers found in one plant monoecious and dioecious plants in them you can see there are male plants and female plants that means the male flowers are in one plant and female flowers in one plant what are the examples this example you can see this is papo male plant and female plant male plants never produce fruits protein take place in female plants and uh, this is valisneria again in valisneria also male and female two plants we can see here this is dates and male flower and female flowers they are housing in two different plants likewise we can categorize plants according to monoecious and dioecious by considering the unisexual flowers and how do they exist or they established on the plants next pollination see this there are two flowers i have named here the pollen grains this means the male part in this flower and the female parts in this flower and to complete the reproduction sexual reproduction process male gamete must meet female gamete let's see how the process take place male gametes first release out the pollens there are agents who carry this pollens let's take an agent here just like this bee bees carry in pollen from one flower to another flower and the pollens carried carried by the bee because of that we call the bee as the pollinator this is the agent of pollination and then pollens come to the stigma of this flower and to complete or to when defining the pollination there should be some factors to pay attention one thing the pollens must fall on the stigma the other fact is these two flowers must belong to same species and that process is the pollination sometimes the pollens of same flower can fall on the stigma of the same that also pollination no matter with that so let's see the factors pollination is when pollen grains from one flower falls on the stigma of the same or different flower belonging to the same species uh, that means if it is a show flower the pollen of show flower must be pollen on another show flower to complete this pollination process right then pollination types look at this this is the anther and there is a pollen here if that is travel to the same stigma it's called self pollination and uh, next occasion there is a pollen here it's traveling to another flower's stigma or the pollen from this flower 
coming towards the stigma of the other flower. This is called cross-pollination. Therefore, pollination is two types as self-pollination and cross-pollination. The self-pollination is disadvantageous. Therefore, plants always try to reduce the self-pollination and promote the cross-pollination. Because if self-pollination takes place, there is less chance to occur variations. Plants need to produce more variations and to get uh, some the strong and strong young generations. Therefore, they will try to reduce the self-pollination and promote the cross-pollination. Let's see the adaptations to avoid self-pollination. First one, unisexual flowers. In this case, two of the same flowers never cross over. I mean, uh, the pollens of this flower will never fall on the same flower. It's because uh, this flower has no female part and this flower has no male part. This is staminate flower and pistil, pistillate flower. Examples, in corn we can see that. Also in pumpkin we can see. And in pepper we can see this. Unisexual flowers. Second one, dichogamy. Look at the diagram. Dichogamy means these two male and female parts mature at two different times. Two different times. One mature early, other one mature later. Therefore, when this one, this stigma maturing or this uh, female part maturing, the pollens are not produced by that as it is not matured. Therefore, it can prevent the self-pollination. Next, examples. This is Catherensis. You know, this is uh, the famous, uh, you might have seen that flower. It's a popular flower in Sri Lanka. And uh, this flower, yes, this is again the maize or the corn flowers. And these flowers also show that uh, different maturation or the dichogamy. Next, Herkogami. In this case, you can see the stigma and the anthers. They are situated at two different levels. As the anther is situated at the bottom, there is less chance to travel these pollens to the stigma. There is less chance. There are examples. This flower, the Catharanthus flowers. And uh, look at this flower. And uh, this is kind of orchid flower. Clearly we can see here there is stigma at top and the anthers at bottom. Right. Then extras stamens. What does it mean? Stamens or the anthers, they just stay away or the bending away from the stigma by keeping certain distance here. And to reduce the chance to travel these pollens on this. So, examples, this one is called Lebek flower and in Sri Lanka we call it Thora and this is Jasmine. These are the examples for extra stamens. Self-sterility. Look at this. Self-sterility is a strong adaptation to prevent the self-pollination. That means if a pollen falls on the stigma of this flower it is useless as this uh, style does not the stigma in a style does not allow that pollen to travel towards the ovary it's completely a kind of chemical response therefore there is no chance to pollen to meet this ova and examples uh, familiar flower this is the passion fruit flower and uh, this flower is called the crab apple or the apple type uh, and also shows the self sterility and here are the adaptations to avoid self pollination again it's some of them uh, unisexual flowers dichogamy hercogamy extra stamen and self sterility so agents of pollination, how does the pollen travel from one flower to another flower? Look at the 
factors there are biotic factors that means animals see this bee it is full of pollen so you can see tiny dots that yellow color things are the pollens it is a good this is a good agent who carries pollen from one flower to another birds bats also comes under this biotic factors and abiotic factors there are two abiotic factors one is wind in some plants the pollen uh, travel through the wind in this case these flowers usually situated at the crest of the plant at the top of the plant corn or maize also the same at the top of the plant you can see the pollen uh, pollen producing or the male parts and the number of pollen so thousands millions of pollens they produce at once to spread it to far distance because wind it is uh, the destination is not clear it just freely flow through the wind and somewhere until it meet another flower and uh, water releasing pollen to water this is ballistic area but don't entangle this one spreading seeds by water is not comes to this category this is the sending pollen through water ballistic area is an example for such plant releasing these pollen to water then it travels to water and meet the female parts and these are the agents of pollination next post pollination phenomena after the pollination what happens after pollination these steps happen i have taken that from the encyclopedia britannica this is very clear diagram and it shows how what does happen after the pollination so here it says the parts of the flower the pollen grain it's coming from the anther once the pollen grains are fall on the stigma these pollen grains have ability to make a tube through the style there is a cell called tube cell it makes a tube like this this is a chemical response and it's a chemotrophic movement and uh, with that chemicals or the chemical secreted by the ova this tube always move towards the ova and through the tube that uh, sperm nuclei or the gamete cells or the end cell is sent in through that that cells then come and meet the ovary you get this one the in the egg nucleus the sperm cell has come and it meets the the ova and these are the ovules finally it forms a zygote here and zygote is a two end cell or diploid cell then haploid cells came here and met another haploid cell finally two and other diploid cell form this is the normal process of sexual reproduction thereafter it grows as an embryo and this embryo developed into a seed and uh, then when seed germinates the seed link take place so this is the process of post fertilization process and what happens to the flower hereafter once the fertilization complete the petals and sepals wither off they remove off and uh, the ovary it develop as a fruit this ovary become a fruit and uh, the ova they become seeds and the peduncle or the stalk of flower becomes the stalk of the fruit so those are the changes happen after the fertilization now seed dispersion once the seeds are produced how they spread to far distance one method is by the wind there are some seeds which has very light seeds number of seeds they produce light seeds light in weight and uh, they have some structures just like feathers or cotton or maybe wings to fly through the wind and they are just uh, floating over the wind and going to the far distance second one by animals look at these examples some just cling on animals 
hang on animals with this hook like thing so the sharp spines or some provide fruit to the animals actually uh, this is uh, this is kind of a tricky thing the animals once they eat this fruit they eat with the seed and seed also carried with the animal somewhere and they are getting chance to spread to far distance with this one by animals second agent is animals third one by water some plants release seeds to water then through water they float and travel to far distance here are some example lotus cat's tail and coconut the coconut fruit whole fruit float through the water it has soft outer cover or the it has kind of less dense fruit to float over the water easily next one by bursting or explosive mechanism some plants burst or explode to disperse their seeds out and exploding and spreading them out here are the examples for such ones and rubber seeds also does the same thing now the modern one is by the human we spread lot of seeds actually the artificially by the farming of when uh, doing the agriculture we spread them also not, without purposefully we just carry them to far distances by vehicles flights or ships from country to country we uh, just uh, send them or the spread them actually that is also a tricky thing in the plant uh, because we use them as the food that's why we spread them that's why we grow them so there are some tricks or some tactics in plants to disperse the seeds into far distance and to disperse their species to wide this wide area so next one the seed germination once a seed spread and falls on the soil the seed will germinate if the seed is a dicotyledonous seed it goes under these steps and the steps are the seeds first produce the root and the seed or the cotyledons raise up they comes out from the ground and thereafter these cotyledons act as the basic photosynthetic devices the photosynthesis started by them thereafter the leaves appear this method is called epigeal method occur in dicotyledonous plants but in monocotyledonous plants process is different it's called hypogeal in them the seed does not come out root and the shoot they appear at the same time root goes downwards shoot comes upwards this is hypogeal one seen in monocotyledonous plants and then the seed germination should be seed germination and it's of two types this is wrong and uh, is of two types here one is the seed germination the biotic factors effect on seed germination what are the factors biotic factors one is the viability of seeds a viability means the ability of a seed or the health of the seed to grow as a new plant next biotic factor effect on the germination is dormancy period or the time taken to grow as a new uh, the just stay as a dry seed and the giving birth to new young one and that is called the dormancy period i will talk about the dormancy here after as well next go to the abiotic factors there are four abiotic factors first one light second the temperature third aeration or oxygen and depth of sowing or depth of sowing means how much it sink in the soil and if all these factors are fulfilled and uh, for the germination if all the factors are fulfilled the seed must be germinated but in that case also once you give all the factors if it is not germinating germinating that is called dormancy seed dormancy if a seed does not germinate even all the essentials are present 
it is called the seed dormancy remember that definition as well and this is the end of our lesson you can find the note or read the note from our blog site www.itsitimeblogspot.com and you can copy down the note to the tute next lesson is about reproduction of man and the male reproductive system from the video part 4 we will meet to cover up this part if you gain something from this video you can press the like button or to get the video notifications first you have to subscribe the YouTube channel and press this bell icon so we can meet next day till that goodbye everybody